Good morning, everyone. Last thing I heard was a yay, so that's great. I hope everyone had, a, had a, another fantastic evening. I know I did. I, uh, I learned from Debbie at CDAS that pangolins' tails are like indicators of their health, and the, if they're above the ground, they're healthy, and as they get closer to the ground, it's an indicator of uh, being less healthy, which um, thankfully for my relationship with my wife, I don't have the same, or I would always be at the doctor. But um, uh, I also wanted to announce that yesterday after, or after Nettie's uh, presentation, uh, Michael Grover from Insight uh, made the very kind offer to um, donate a uh, Meals for Rangers uh, pack like this to everyone that submits a, a re product review or service review on InsightCWC.com by the end of tomorrow. Great. Um, thank you for that. So. Yes, thank you, exactly. Thanks for the clarification. Um, okay, great. Uh, so before presenting the second Conservation Tech Award for the year, I wanted to recognize the judging panel. Um, this is um, uh, mostly a really incredible group of people. Uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, so someone managed to slip in there, but uh, the really a, a remarkable um, group of brilliant minds from throughout conservation and technology who helped evaluate the um, various applications, which as I mentioned yesterday was particularly difficult this year. Uh, there were so many um, fantastic ones. So um, sincere thank you to all of them. And yeah. And before I announce the award, I, I just want to say that um, there, there's a saying that hardware is hard, uh, which, which is really true. And I, uh, it's especially in awe of that as a software person myself, it, it takes a enormous variety of skills. So you not only need to be able to design the hardware itself, but also uh, all of the surrounding mechanics and the embedded software. And typically these things now, especially in conservation, have a communication aspect, which then goes to a server, and you need server software. So it's um, frankly, in a lot of ways, much harder than software. Uh, it's very expensive to make the first one. Um, you have to find a manufacturing partner. You have to go through multiple rounds of iterations. You have to find uh, distribution partners to source all the materials. Um, then you have something physical that you can't just put up on a URL for a web browser. You have to distribute it in conservation's case around the world. You then have to support it. If something goes wrong, you have to be able to receive them. You have to be able to fix them, send them back, up, back out. And in conservation, this is even harder. Uh, it's much, finder, much harder to find any sort of angel investor to help you make the first ones. You are dealing with a small market with no ability to buy anything, which is a little bit hard for creating products. Um, you're working in extremely challenging deployment environments uh, physically, you know, with the rain, humidity, um, remoteness. You have incredible language and literacy problems. You have the physical difficulty to actually deploy it. I think we've all seen photos of uh, engineers who are typically behind desks but somehow find themselves strapped into uh, rigging systems and they're up in tall trees in the Amazon or, or wherever. Um, and you have baboons and elephants that are going out of their way to destroy everything that you've done to get there thus far. Um, so with that I want to say that I'm particularly in awe of the work of the grantee of the Conservation Technology Award for the Outstanding Practitioner of Conservation Technology. And I'm very pleased to announce the winner of that is Conservation X Labs. And uh, Sam from Conservation X Labs is here to tell us a bit more about what they've built. Uh, thanks, Jess. Uh, hi, Ron. So I'm Sam Kelly. I am with Conservation X Labs and lead the Sentinel project. Just firstly, would love to thank uh, Earth Ranger uh, and AI2 uh, for, for this award. I'd also love to thank all the judges that were involved with, with judging this. It's, it's a great... Um, 
it's reassuring to know that <clears throat> all the work we've been putting in is uh, needed and, and wanted uh, for everyone, or, or at least some of you here in this room. Uh, it means a lot, um, so thank you. Uh, so Sentinel at its core is about trying to upgrade those existing camera traps that are out there in the field uh, with the ability to uh, uh, and intelligently uh, upgrade them with AI and a satellite connection. Um, but really, what this is about is trying to empower those who are on the front lines of conservation. Uh, and, and we've de deployed in, in, in a number of use cases, but I'm going to highlight a few just quickly. Um, firstly, uh, in community scenarios where there, uh, people in the community are not necessarily full-time involved uh, in conservation, but need, to, or need or want to contribute to projects on a part-time basis by, by monitoring on, on, on private lands. Uh, and so this is the, uh, on the left-hand side, a deployment we have in, in Colombia related to that. Uh, on the right-hand side, we work a lot with uh, researchers interested in uh, real-time data that uh, in the past was hard to obtain because of uh, connectivity issues and the like. This is a researcher uh, interested in understanding uh, how grizzly bears uh, behave uh, over the hibernation period uh, in Canada. But I think uh, most, most importantly and, and most commonly here in this room is I want to highlight um, the use case in, in the ranger kind of scenario. Uh, in the middle there is uh, Freddy. He is a uh, the lead ranger uh, in, in, in one of the Galapagos Islands, uh, responsible for maintaining a grid of, of, of 75 cameras, um, which historically obviously would, would require a lot of manual work uh, and, and uh, retrieval of SD cards. Uh, and, and what the system allows uh, him to do in, in a lot of ways is more efficiently deploy his resources uh, so he's not necessarily out there collecting SD cards, uh, but, but also prioritizing his time to all of the other work that, that rangers have to do um, uh, every day. So just that, uh, a quickly, like, what, is, what does Sentinel do from like, a very practical perspective? Uh, you put a camera out in the environment, you know, your Econics, your Bushnell, your Browning, whatever you currently use, just a standard camera. We plug into that. Uh, it takes the, the, cam takes the, the camera takes the photo, we take that image in, we process it with a model that is specific to your use case, that answers a question that you want to, to know. We send that information back over satellite. I would note that we can also work on LoRa or cellular, but I've, I've heard time and time again this, at this conference that connectivity is a huge problem for all of you, uh, and so I want to really highlight that, that we work on satellite. Uh, due to the Gundi, um, we're able to pump directly into Earth Ranger and Smart, so we kind of meet you where you already are. Uh, and that is really key to the whole design philosophy of Sentinel, which is trying to be easy to deploy and manage. Ideally, this technology makes your life easier, not harder. Um, so just quickly, I want to run through some of the use cases we, 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 uh, we can do. Uh, so we have human and vehicle detection. Obviously, that's a, a common use case for you all uh, for, for security and anti-poaching scenarios. Uh, we also uh, have got relatively, um, you know, we, we, we do a lot of species detection as well. Um, everyone has a different question. That means everyone needs to have a different model. Um, so we'll work with you uh, uh, to make those custom models that answer those questions for people in the field. We're also looking forward a little bit and doing some, some more cutting, uh, cutting edge research uh, in the behavioral space. This is uh, the Florida panther subspecies of mountain lion uh, in the United States, uh, and this is a neurological disease that affects them, uh, and we're able to detect this uh, in video from camera trap uh, footage, so uh, trying to push some of the health stuff as well. Uh, this is not Zala, uh, this is not on the ground, but hoping to be so soon, uh, around tagging both behavior monitoring and then tying that behavior to individuals, so really starting to imagine what we can do with AI beyond species classification. So we have deployed, uh, in the last three months, uh, over 100 devices across six countries and have had 20, 25,000 plus observations coming back from those devices. So we're just starting to get that to the exciting stage of you know, scaling up. As Jess mentioned, a lot of the challenges around hardware are around that scale up pit portion. But we are past that, that you know, making it a stable device and trying to address some of those challenges around making many devices now. Uh, so we are in a number of different places. Um, I would note on this map, uh, you'll see that we are predominantly focused right now on the Americas. Uh
to expand Sentinel into new use cases uh, and new applications. Um, we're really hoping to find some partners, uh, and we haven't fully finalized this, so please come and chat to us, um, that are willing to actively test and give some honest feedback. We realize that every use case and location has its nuances, and would love to learn about how we need to adapt or change the product to meet, meet you uh, and, and your needs. Um, particularly interested in the idea of, of using Sentinel in, in the space of security and anti-poaching. As I mentioned, we don't have any active on the ground uh, uh, users in Africa, so again, would love to chat um, with you all um, and, and expand that space. Uh, and then also really interested in, like I showed you that, the Florida Panthers, getting into some more of the animal health work um, and, and expanding in there. So uh, veterinarians or, or people in that space would love to chat a little bit more. Uh, we'll be at the vendor booth, but again, uh, thank you so much to Earth Ranger and AI2 uh, for this. Uh, excited um, for what, what's to come with Sentinel, uh, and, and hope to work with you all uh, pretty soon. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, now I have the privilege of welcoming our final uh, guest keynote speaker. Um, forgive me for reading a little bit more than I have in the past, but I've butchered enough titles, and Monica's background, the, the impressiveness of her background is only matched by the impressiveness of some of her titles. Um, uh, so uh, we, we, we're, uh, we're very privileged to have the president and CEO of Wildlife Conservation Society with us this morning, uh, Monica Medina, and her dedication to wildlife conservation and environmental stewardship has made an indelible mark on our world even before joining WCS. And um, prior to WCS, Monica worked in the US Department of State as the first US diplomat uh, designated to advocate for global biodiversity and served as United States Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Um, pivotal in the US's adoption of the 30 by 30 goal and the country's lead negotiator for the, for the adoption of the historic United Nations Agreement to protect marine biodiversity in international waters, we're really privileged to have our leadership in the ongoing fight to save wildlife and wild places. So please join me in welcoming Monica Medina. See if I can work the technology. Good morning, everybody. Wow, what a great turnout. Thank you so much. It's so uh, nice to see everyone here. It's so nice to see all my team from WCS who's here. I know we have a great turnout at this conference, and I know we are busy doing a lot of the work um, with all of you. So let me just say thank you very much. It's great to be in a room of kindred spirits. I know that most of you are making big sacrifices to do this work. If you're in tech, you've given up working in some fancy for-profit um, or the upside of some startup, and instead you're here with us in this fight to hold on to nature. And if you're in the security side, the, the, the ranger side, you've given up comfort and convenience to live out in the field. You guys are the real superheroes. I, I have some, had some great jobs, uh, but I know who's out there doing the real hard work. Um, it's you. And you are here because you love nature and wildlife, and you want to save it for future generations. And I'm here to tell you there's nothing more important than the work that you're doing. So we know we are up against um, some real challenges, and we see the devastating impacts of nature's decline everywhere all across the planet. We see particularly three major crises right now, and you all know them, the collapse of biodiversity, and as many as one million plants and animals are at risk of extinction. You all know that, but it's kind of a huge number. It's hard to wrap your mind around. And then climate change, like this slide indicates, and all the devastation that we've seen, um, you know, most recently in Acapulco, but across continents in places. It was interesting. I was reading a, an article, and, and someone from the developing world was sort of talking about this upcoming COP and warning people in the developed world, it's coming for you. And boy, it is. Um, and 
the persistent threat of zoonotic diseases. We've all lived through COVID. What an amazingly challenging thing that was for people, but also um, the continued ecological risk that it uh, poses because of the spillover and the use of wildlife in ways that puts people at greater risk. These, com these crises are compounding and interrelated, which makes them even more daunting. And it's hard, I know, some days to think that um, we have a way to get through them, but we are making progress. But on top of that, as you all know, we are up against some real villains. You superheroes are up against some real bad people doing bad things, desperate people, which is sad, or greedy people, which is really awful, or downright evil people taking you know, the resources from people, leaving behind devastation, hunger, or human uh, you know, trafficking, and all the other related drugs, um, to terrorism, to uh, guns, everything that we know is interrelated. So you're up against some challenges, and I want to take a minute, because it's almost Remembrance Day or Veterans Day, to say how much I want to honor the legacy of the people who have actually made the ultimate sacrifice in this work. I was at the um, Virunga National Park uh, tribute. Um, they have actual, actually a memorial in Virunga Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, because they've had so many fallen rangers, hundreds of them over the last few years. And I know people in this room are in harm's way and put their lives at risk. So I want to say how much I appreciate the sacrifice that you make. So let me get hopeful here. Um, we know that while the impacts we're seeing are interrelated, we know also that nature is our planet's lifeline. And the thing that protects us from things getting worse. And so here we are motivated to protect the thing that we know can save us. It's nature that sits at the heart both of the degradation that we see, but also at the, the solution. Nature is resilient. Nature can regenerate. To me, nature is hope. So what are we trying to do? As you mentioned, Jess, we're trying to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. Oh my gosh, we couldn't get to 20 by 2020, and we have to get to 30 by 2030. But it's not enough just to protect 30%, any 30%. We have to protect the right parts, the parts of the planet that are still intact, that have the basis to be resilient in the face of all the threats that we know that we've just discussed. We're talking about ecological integrity, the degree to which nature is free from degradation of its structure, its composition, and its function. These are the things that make it robust and resilient and able to give us hope. We have to protect nature that is intact and still functions as a system. So that's what we're trying to do at WCS, and I know that's what unites us, all of us, in this room. We are an enormous, at WCS, we are an enormous large-based field organization. Field organization, that's why I joined WCS and why I'm so excited to be a part of, of WCS and of all the work that we are doing here. We are on the ground and we're scaling impact, all of us together, working together, everywhere, providing on-the-ground results for nature and, it, most importantly, for the people who depend on it. We are providing hope and the places in the places that need us most. So what's our approach at WCS? We are hoping to protect nature's strongholds all over the planet. WCS's global conservation approach is strategically designed around landscapes and seascapes across the world where nature is strong. 
That is where ecological integrity is high and it is through identifying these areas with the high ecological integrity that not only can we cap keep the most biodiversity safe, but we can keep the system safe and resilient in the face of climate change and biodiversity loss and zoonotic spillover. And we can provide a wealth of benefits to people locally, regionally, and globally. So nature's strongholds are not only, and here, here is the vast number of projects and places where we're working at WCS right now. So nature's strongholds not only contain the most biodiversity, but they also store vast amounts of carbon and resili are resilient to climate change. Their protec protection reduces the likelihood of future zoonotic pandemics and provides health and eco economic benefits to people locally and globally. Nature's stronghold help us to address the climate crisis. It's a truly global effort because we can't address the climate crisis in any one place. We have to address it globally. It supports, these strongholds will support over 27 million kilometers squared and they're home to 50% of all the species on earth. They include these carbon rich areas as I said and they're so important for the people who've been protecting them for potentially thousands of years, for millennia. The indigenous peoples and local communities who've been the best stewards on the planet up until now. So who are we? Again, we operate in over 50 countries. We at WCS have 3,500 staff over 90% of which are national staff. And it was funny, our team was talking the other day and, and we realized that most of them weren't trained in technology. They were trained in science or in um, management or logistics, but they're becoming technologists because that's how we're getting after these problems. And we work collaboratively with governments and with those indigenous communities and local communities and the private sector our 3,500 staff members are supporting the conservation of 27 million square kilometers of the highest ecological integrity across the globe, from preventing loss to protecting and restoring ecosystems. And that's an area the size of North America, and it's global. So our reach is global. Despite the immense challenges, we believe that there is reason for optimism. There are many indicators that are showing us that we're at a crucial turning point for humanity and for nature, and that if we take the right steps, we could address, we hope to address, we want to address the many challenges that we face today. And we know that if we protect the last wild places on the planet now, a child born today could see an amazing rebound of nature, and I know that you've all seen it. We have just a few examples that we wanna, I wanna point out, um, and particularly ones where we've seen nature rebound in a very short amount of time. We've reduced elephant poaching in Ndoki, Congo, which is an amazing place. I actually just visited there a couple of months ago, and to see nature rebounding, to see elephant populations growing there, see the reduction in poaching through really smart efforts at conservation, protection, stewardship, the kinds of technologies that you all are working on to implement in the field, it's just an amazing thing. We've also seen tiger populations grow, and you know tigers were on the risk at the on the verge of extinction, not that long ago. And we've supported the creation of so many new marine protected areas around the world, and that global agreement I hope will spur the creation of so many more, particularly out in the high seas, which are the hardest places to see, but where with the technology that you all creating are creating, we can finally do that. We know from these examples that governance works and that conservation works, but without technology, 
it's really hard to do it well. So that's why I'm optimistic when I sit in a room like this where I see the work that you all are doing in technology to protect nature. And we at WCS are trying to do our part by creating an impact platform that's an all-in-one place to visualize impact and track data trends and share the stories that matter most. We know that tech is crucial and it's a way to both measure our impact and to see it, to literally see it in ways that we could never do before. You can't manage or protect what you can't measure. I'm really proud of the work that we've done with technology. For example, example the SMART program. Our ambition was to roll out SMART at 100 sites, and today it's the most widely used spatial monitoring tool with over 1,000 sites in 80 countries. But it's just one of many, and it's so exciting to hear about the new ones, like Conservation X Lab's new technology. We have to create an ecosystem of complementary and symbiotic technologies to be a force multiplier for protecting nature and intact ecosystems. And the last decade has been an incredible period of innovation. WCS has had the honor of being a founding partner in many of the key conservation technology initiatives. And again, I want to thank all the people involved in that. And I emphasize a partner because it's been an incredible journey because we've come together, we've been able to do so much more, build solutions that we might never ever have imagined. And for law enforcement, wildlife monitoring, social science, and so many other areas, people have access to tools that they could not have dreamed of 10 years ago. Together with AI2, WPS, and others continue to analyze and create and catalyze innovation, feeding data from camera traps, wildlife trackers and hundreds of field sensors into tools that drive decisions and on the ground change, democratizing access to artificial intelligence and channelizing R&D of academia and the tech sector into practical, meaningful solutions. All these technologies, plus many more, contribute to our ability to monitor impact at every scale. And I have to stop here and say it's just freaking amazing to me. I can remember, you know, typewriters with ribbon, right? I didn't grow up in a world with cell phones. We couldn't communicate with each other on the spot. And now we walk around with handheld supercomputers that are able to store, display, and send out vast quantities of information anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds. That's just in my lifetime. Think what we can do in yours. You're all younger than me. I've now just shown my age. But I'm proud to say how much I've seen, even in just the last 10 years as I've been working in this field and really focused in on conservation, protection, and um, the need for real boots on the ground protection for conservation. From my time, I've spent a little time in the Pentagon, in the Obama administration, and noticed that the places where we saw terrorism activity increasing were also the places where we saw elephant poaching just shooting up massively happening. And, you know, the, the idea that today we can see out into the ocean to protect that vast 70% of the planet that we couldn't even see before. It's just an amazing thing. And we know that we have to do that. We know that we have to see across the globe. We have to be revolutionary. We have to break out of any sort of preconceived notions, be creative, think outside the box, be ambitious, build these tools, because we know that without them, we won't be able to save that 30%. And we need to keep building bigger and bigger solutions that we can drive for change across the planet. And I know that at this conference, we've seen some amazing success stories. And hopefully, that's just the beginning. Um, and that's why I really want to talk to you about what we hope to deliver in the future. Yes, sorry. Oh, is the. <laughs> Technology, it works all the time, except when it doesn't. <laughs> but it's not bad, it's okay. Um, 
conservation technology is essential to delivering our shared on our shared mission. It plays a vital role by ensuring that practitioners have access to advanced solutions and law enforcement and wildlife for law enforcement and wildlife monitoring. And we're dedicated to crafting these tools and the best practices globally to prioritize the diverse needs of practitioners worldwide. And this commitment involves substantial investment in understanding what truly matters to all of you, which is why it's so great to have both technologists and the user community in this room. So let's be nature positive. Let's imagine a world where conservationists have access to the latest technologies and guidance on how to deploy them, regardless of their location or resources. A world where technologists and conservationists collaborate and innovate together, sharing their knowledge and expertise to solve the most pressing conservation challenges of the day. So what's the next big leap? To ensure that conservation practitioners continue to step up and drive the future of conservation, WCS and our partners are committed to creating a network of conservation technology hubs across 50 plus countries. We will build a network of demonstration sites that not only showcase and evaluate technologies, but also create opportunities for conservation tech providers and practitioners to innovate and develop solutions together based on the realities of field conservation. We will transform how training is provided for practitioners, moving away from a model where training on individual tools like Smart or Earth Ranger is the way to an integrated approach covering practices, areas such as law enforcement and wildlife monitoring ensuring that practitioners have the breadth and depth of tools and best practices needed to secure conservation. We will develop technical support hubs and invest in the next generation of conservation technology leaders, providing expert guidance and consultancy to help solve both the most time sensitive and challenging issues. And we'll make sure those services are available 24 seven, both locally and uh, internationally. And as ever, we believe in partnership and not working in isolation. Our vision is for this network of centers and of excellence and hubs that extend across organizational boundaries and country boundaries. And while technology is a cornerstone, our ultimate objective is effective conservation action. It's not just about innovation. It's about translating those innovative ideas into tangible and meaningful conservation efforts. These hubs will be instrumental in turning concepts into real world initiatives and fostering positive change on a global scale and taking us from what is miraculous to me today to something even unimaginable tomorrow. So I wanna thank everyone here for all of the work that you do, um, for all the incredible achievements of the last 10 years and beyond, but mo more importantly, for what you're going to do in the 10 years ahead. At this moment, we have a unique opportunity, possibly unlike any other in the past, where global attention is trained on nature now, where we are bringing technology and people who could be doing this work in the for-profit sector are, are coming into our sector, to, into nature and biodiversity and conservation in order to help us save the planet. It's crucial to our shared success, and I welcome all the commitments that people have made here this week. Um, I just can't say it enough. We have this moment. We have momentum. We're building something incredible here. And if I leave you with anything, I hope it's the knowledge that you are going to be able to make history by using technology not to destroy nature. Think about it. The Industrial Revolution has been an amazing thing to make our modern world possible, to make us smarter, less poor, but it's also been incredibly destructive of nature. So let's stop now and use 
technology to actually protect nature. That can be our legacy. That can be your legacy. And we have to do it because we know that the planet and all of us who live on it and future generations depend on it. We only have this one planet. And we are the species that have done the most damage to it by far so far. But we are the only species on the planet that is capable of saving it. And it's our sacred responsibility to sh ensure that every creature and every human on the planet today can sustain themselves and so can future generations. And I know when I look at this room and I see all of the talent and all of the dedication, all of the enthusiasm, all the energy, all of the drive, all of the determination, the grit, all that you all give up to be doing this work, I know that we can do it together. So thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. I'm inspired by what you do every day. And I'm hoping that with just these few words, I've helped to keep you inspired to continue to do this important work for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, and, and thank you to all of the WCS staff that are here and the WCS staff around the world for all of your partnership and, and just all of the incredible work that you do to um, help protect these places. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, can't, can't even get into it that the scope of it is so large, but uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Please, everyone, enjoy the third day of the conference, and we will see you back here this afternoon. <laughs>